The delegate assemblies in Century Village have recently become a free-for-all. A lot of shouting, displays of anger, and a general uproar in what should be a civilized and orderly procedure. Just what is going on? Why is there so much disruption? What is the cause of the chaos? I reviewed a lot of the Delegate Assembly videos in an attempt to analyze the proceedings from a public relations perspective. In general, the meetings start out with a calm and well-mannered decorum, but soon disintegrate into shouting matches between the executive panel and the delegates. Some blame the executives, who appear to be furious with their actions on one issue or another, and others blame the delegates for the disruption. Some are of the opinion that many of the delegates are in attendance for the sole purpose of creating a disturbance, a view that is frequently espoused by the chair in comments and publications. The recent defeat of two major initiatives presented by the executive board indicates a growing dissatisfaction among the assembly. The overwhelming defeat of the current budget and the wide pro five proposals is seen by many as a victory for those who oppose the executive. A position that apparently stems from their dissatisfaction not only with the budget and the Wi-Fi initiative, but with the general overall dissatisfaction of the current administration. I have some video excerpts of the meetings to demonstrate what I believe may lead to this chaos. The first clip is of the president shouting at a delegate and demanding compliance with his instructions. I don't think what the president is saying is so bad but the way he's saying it is completely wrong. No one likes to be shouted at like a child who is misbehaving. The tone of the president's voice demonstrates a dictatorial and sometimes sarcastic attitude that most certainly would not only anger many, but also invite delegates to behave in a similar manner. And the failure of the rest of the executive panel to object to his behavior gives the impression that they are supportive of this behavior. For the most part, they sit in silence and are obviously deferring to the chair. Their inaction infers that they are there solely to reinforce the position of the chair and are seen by many as nothing more than psychophants. Don't interrupt. No. Don't interrupt the, a speaker. The, Randall, you're out of order. Thank you. I knew you would end. Don't interrupt a speaker. This next gentleman approached the panel with a reasonable question. He asked in a calm and respectful manner, but he failed to get an answer from the board. By not answering or addressing the issue, it frustrates not only the delegate, but others who are disappointed by the apparent lack of concern from the panel. Familiar when you have a reserve fund schedule that you have some professional engineering company, whoever, that goes and physically accounts for all the a, items. That and may gives, be our goal during 2015. Because yeah, these estimates seem, you know, you could have it any way you want. It might, how could it be more than 100,000? You might, uh, if you had some exotic thing for, I don't know, for Century Village, I might say it's 10,000. Like, you know, how do you, what's the rationale for that and for all these items? That's, that's my question. Thank you. In this next clip, this gentleman was rebuffed by the treasurer who couldn't or wouldn't answer. There are others in the audience who may have had the same concerns and were eagerly awaiting the answer, but they were frustrated by his response. Acting in this manner makes the executive appear to be evasive. Yes, that's why, because Thank I still didn't much. get the answer that I uh, was expecting to know why is okay. it going to general, which is vague, from a designated contracted expense. Well, you, I can't explain it to you right now. Ah, okay. You know. In this next clip, a great point was made. This gentleman raised a very pointed question that was sloughed off and rebuffed by the executive but an answer. This leads to frustration and raises the level of anger among the delegates. Why are we now being asked to pay four times for the same roads?
This lady's concern was brushed aside with an answer that suggested the police would handle the problem. I'm sure that there were many who were of the mind that it would be a simple matter for the executive to bring her concerns to the security company, rather than hoping that the police would deal with it. This is seen as an abrogation of the duties of the executive to deal with a minor issue, and an unsympathetic attitude from the chair. Some reassurance that this matter would be, would be dealt with through the authority of the executive would not only satisfy the petitioner, but it would leave the impression that they were caring about the concerns of others, and they will act on their behalf, regardless of their personal feelings. I've noticed the new security company have been um, exceeding the speed limit around um, around Gulf's Edge, and I just wonder if they're susceptible to speeding tickets too. All right. Um, we would hope that PBSO would issue them a nice juicy ticket. In this clip, a sarcastic remark from the chair indicates the lack of respect he has for people in general. Sarcasm should not be employed in an assembly. It invites sarcastic replies from the audience. Shouting down and interrupting a speaker is not a good tactic either. The chair should know this and lead by example. Loud, angry responses from the chair invite the audience to respond in a similar fashion. You're out of order, Dan. No, Please I'm not out of order. Some of the guy already moved. Please be and seated. And let me show you. Over here, it's a point of order. One was sitting here, and then he moved to the other place. What That's already saying, illegal. What you're saying is people cheat. <laughs> How strange. The lady making this remark obviously became a little frightened and seemed to be intimidated by the response. This behavior angers people in the audience who may not sympathize with her statement but are offended by the treatment she received. May I say something? Ah, oh, Jesus. I know, don't get upset with me. <laughs> this next statement was clipped from an executive meeting. The chair is branding the delegates as a mob. Remarks of a similar nature were published on the chairman's website. This kind of remark is offensive to many and seen as childish by others. As long as I'm here, you go, will not be driven by the mob. In reviewing this clip, I wonder if the chairman really sees the delegate as a mob, or is just using that as an excuse to blame others for his failures. Either way, it's an unacceptable remark. And many see this as a convenient way for the executive to escape responsibility by creating scapegoats for their failures. In this clip, the chairman is given an excuse for the reason he broke his word to allow an audit of the books. The excuse is kind of weak, and it gives the impression that he can't be trusted to do what he says he'll do. This erodes trust that the delegates may have for him and the administration. The last meeting, Mr. Israel, I made a suggestion that we have a forensic audit. There was some discussion about it, and at the meeting, you came out and said, okay, Mr. Grossman, I'm giving you permission to do a forensic audit. What, what's the question, Myron? You changed your mind. Why did you change your mind? Because in, in, in consideration of the canon of ethics for professions, you must um, engage an auditor or an attorney um, who is unbiased and can perform an arm's length transaction. In this clip, it shows the chairman's determination to avoid an examination of the books. The underlying inference is that he is being evasive and is hiding something. I'm a licensed CPA practicing, which Howard hasn't been for 10 years, and I volunteer my time to come in and go through the books and audit it. That's my motion. There was a motion? Uh, let's talk about, if, if Howard wants to have a town hall, that's fine. 
the motion is utterly out of order. And, and what basis? And just disruptive on its face. All right? All right. I, I didn't hear a motion. Ed? That's the motion. Ed, would you please? You're out of order. Please Excuse be Excuse me. That's a motion, David. We're not going to have a disruptive town hall meeting. That's because not what I said. What did you say? I said I am willing to come in and do a forensic audit. And the chairman shouting, bullying, and evasive tactics is seen as the only defense he can muster in an attempt, and in an attempt to portray his administration as open and transparent, he finally relents and makes the statement that the questioner is welcome to examine the books, a promise he obviously never intended to keep. And he never asked the delegates' opinion on this matter, which could have been denied if it was put to a vote. This suggests to the delegates that their opinions don't matter, and it redu induces retaliation from the assembly. Point Please be seated. Order. We have a point of order. All right, he made a motion, and I'll tell you right now, if he's offering to do it for free, I second it. I have invited him, I have invited him to come do it for free. No motion is necessary. There you go. No come motion it. is necessary. Right. That motion was unnecessary. Can, can, can I go a, on with the uh, offer? The offer has been accepted. It need go no further than okay. that. Okay. In reviewing delegate assemblies that have taken place before the current administration was installed, there's very few instances of the shouting and disruption that are the hallmark of the current meetings. In conversation with many residents, I discovered that many feel disenfranchised by the refusal of the president to include them in participation in the ver any of the various committees. This is due to their opposition or criticism of his initiatives. There seems to be a reluctance to promote a dissenting opinion or offer a criticism in front of the assembly, therefore exposing delegates to ridicule, sarcastic remarks, or to be be belittled or branded as a troublemaker. Many residents claim they are denied the ability to publish comments on the president's website and claim that the village newspaper and the cable television channel are reluctant to publish dissenting opinions while readily publishing articles to support the president's position. Whether this is true or not, those media are perceived by residents as being biased and engaging in censorship. It is interesting to note that the cable channel and the newspaper are both controlled by the vice president, who is seen by many as being deferential and subservient to the president. The recent paving job performed in the village is another source of dissatisfaction. Residents feel cheated by the expenditure of five million dollars on a shoddy job that will require another huge outlay of money to rectify. The performance on this job, which is seen as incompetent, leads to the suspicion that the executive is not doing a good job and looking out for the resident's interest. And though there is no evidence to support the contention by a lot of residents that corruption played a prominent role in awarding the paving contract, that suspicion exists, and it is discussed in private among the residents. The refusal by the president to allow examination of the financial record fuels the suspicion that something underhanded took place. So this apparent incompetence and suspicion of corruption by the board in the paving project, it did contribute to the overwhelming defeat of the Wi-Fi initiative. Many residents oppose it simply because they are becoming increasingly unhappy with the attitude of the president who promoted this initiative with a great deal of enthusiasm. The adversarial attitude created by these conditions is brought into the delegate assemblies and is manifested by outbursts of disruptive behavior by those who feel there is no other way to convey their dissatisfaction. The lack of respect, 
the shouting, sarcasm, evasion, and the dictatorial attitude from the chair is a reflected by the delegates who follow the example of the executive and behave in a similar fashion. And any goodwill derived from the dedication and work of the executives can be destroyed in an instant with one callous or sarcastic remark from any member of the board. If any member is permitted to engage in objectionable behavior without being censured by the other members, then the entire executive is seen as supportive of bad behavior. In my career in public relations and advertising, I have instructed prominent public figures in the art of presenting themselves to the public in a favorable fashion. And I would be more than happy to share this knowledge with any who would like to gain insight into the problems they are encountering in dealing with their constituents. But I have to say that in view of the prevailing arrogant, uncompromising attitude and the denial of any suggestion that the board of directors may be causing the problems they are encountering, leads me to believe that it may just be tilting at windmills. It is infinitely more difficult to repair a damaged re reputation than it is to build and maintain a good one from ground zero. I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope that this little video, in my opinion, will make some difference in calming down the chaos that's taking place in our wonderful village here in South Florida.